Hello, I'm Joe Kasser, and I'm just setting up to share my screen. Okay, let's start. This is a presentation on applying systems thinking. There's a lot of stuff out there on what systems thinking is and the benefits of it, but there's not much there on actually applying it and examples of using it. So what I want to show here in this presentation is why you should be using it and also some examples. This is the first half of a presentation that I made on the 1st of June here in Adelaide using Zoom. It's been updated and slightly expanded since it's the first half. The second half was on applying systems thinking to Jews and Judaism, and that is a separate presentation. So why use systems thinking or what's in it for you? Well, there are various opinions, but the one I like is the one from Rabbi Moshe Chaim Lozato, who wrote, when people know a number of things, and one of them understands how the things are systematically categorized and related, that person has an advantage over the others who don't have the same understanding. So, you get a competitive edge. From my experience and from some of the literature, you see solutions where other people see problems. You see connections and you see ambiguity, which allows you to make jokes. English humor is based on ambiguity. Sometimes the jokes are poor and I will provide you with some examples in this talk. You think for yourself, which makes you less likely to be manipulated by other people. And you may get a reputation for answering asking good questions when you start using active brainstorming, which I'll show you in a while. And if you can't keep your mouth shut, you will get yourself into trouble. I know, been there, done that five times, at least. So the objectives of the talk are not to get you into trouble, it's to introduce systems thinking and critical thinking to show you how to do it by providing some examples, to examine some aspects of problems, to give you some systems thinking tools you can use right away, to change the way you think, and also to introduce you to the subject, so you might wanna take one of my courses, or even somebody else's course, as long as you learn to think, as long as you learn to apply systems thinking. So the topics are listed here. Excuse me a moment. Why I'm giving this talk, what is systems thinking? What is a problem, solving problems, systems thinking and beyond, solving problems using systems thinking and beyond, what is systems thinking and beyond, and critical thinking. And the this is a breadth talk and the depth, all the material is in my book which you are welcome to access on Amazon. There will be a small fee. <coughs> so why am I giving this talk? Well, I'm paying forward. In third and fourth grade, my key teacher was one of the few teachers, in fact, the only teacher who encouraged me to question. Most of the other stuff was memorization, which was pretty boring but he encouraged me to question. However, he didn't tell me that I'd need to think before I could ask a question, because I'd have to think one up. And he didn't teach me to think. And it took me a long time to learn to think. We don't teach that. We teach memorization and we teach pattern matching. If you're in this situation, do this. If you're in this situation, do this. But the real world, doesn't always map these situations. And so that's when you get lost. So this talk encourages you to ask questions, tries to teach you to think, and discusses questions and answers as problems and solutions. And I encourage you that if you're interested in systems thinking, study it up on your own. Take one of my courses. You can try them out for free 
on my website. So what's a system? Before you need to do system thinking, you have to think about what's a system. So a system is generally thought of as a set of objects having a relationship between them. So you can see here in the drawing, there's this set of objects. They're inside a boundary. That's the yellow area with the dotted line. And presumably there's a relationship between them. There are many different definitions of systems, but the common element in all those definitions is this basic objects having relationships between them. So when we're thinking about a situation, and a situation is a system, because it's made up of things having relationships between them, system thinkers will ask the Kipling questions. The Kipling questions are who, what, where, when, why, and how. I call them the Kipling questions because Rudyard Kipling introduced them in his poem, The Elephant's Child, in his Just So Stories. And these questions help us develop an understanding. You may have heard of the five whys as a tool to develop an understanding of the root cause of an undesirable situation. And so by asking these questions in a systemic and systematic manner, we can think about a situation and gain an understanding of that situation. For example, how questions help us develop an understanding. Of how does this work? And would this work or how is this as a solution? Or what questions? What do we need to do? what's causing this undesirability? We often say what's causing this problem, but what we really mean is what's causing this undesirability. Moving on. I'm giving you topics every, at the end of each point, it's a break point where you can stop the video and, and do something else. Or in my online, in my real classes, this is the point where I would stop and say any questions. I use a lot of feedback in, in my teaching. So what is systems thinking? Well, it depends on who you ask or who you read. In the past, it's been difficult to learn and it's been difficult to teach. When I was teaching systems thinking at the University of South Australia 20 years ago, 15 years ago, I could teach the benefits of it I could teach the definitions of it. I could teach the history of it, but I couldn't teach how to do it other than use a causal loop. And I didn't think that was a very desirable situation. So being in academia, when you want to do something, you have to get a grant. So I looked around for a grant and I found one in the UK. And so, we had a relationship with Cranfield University, so I put in an application through Cranfield University and received a grant from the Leverhulme Trust to research how to teach systems thinking as part of my systems engineering course and moved to the UK and built on the world, world built on the work of somebody called Barry Richmond and actually developed an approach of teaching systems thinking practically and students saw the benefit and I could see the differences in the products that the, in the exercises or the products that the students produced and in their thinking. So the way you do it starts like this. You might remember the parable story of the blind men feeling an elephant and each one of them feels a different aspect. And so they surmise that different things. None of them can perceive the whole picture or, or the whole thing. So in order to understand something, you have to be all the elephants and perceive the situation from a number of different perspectives. Now, when you look at the literature on systems thinking, 
you can parcel it or group it into two schools of thought. Some people call systemic thinking systems thinking. Some people call systematic thinking systems thinking. And very few people say you need both. Systemic thinking, you need to be all the blind men and look at the system from a number of different perspectives. There's Sherlock and he's looking at the system. And you also need to take time. Don't jump the gun. Many people will look at a situation, they will identify something and they will run, jump straight in and implement it. There's an old quotation and I don't remember where it comes from, but it says, for every problem there is a solution that is immediately intuitively obvious and wrong. So you need to think about it for a while and then implement the solution. The first solution is not necessarily the best one you need to conserve. Consider other ones, and you do that systematically using a process, what we call the systems thinking, what we call the system thinking process, the problem solving process, or the decision making process. It's pretty much the same. So here's a question to make you think. Opinions on wearing a face mask when going shopping during the COVID-19 pandemic differ. Should you wear a mask or not? Yes or no? And why? Write down the answer. You've got 15 seconds. Time's up, pencils down, whatever. If you need more time, stop the video and take it. And I apologize, there was no music during that interval. So moving on, what's a problem? Well, there's a problem with that. Did you notice the poor joke? What's the problem? There's a problem with a problem. Never mind. I get that all the time. The problem with the problem is the word problem has several meanings. First one is any question or matter of doubt, uncertainty or difficulty. Making this presentation is going to be a problem. Getting my wife to listen to me is a problem. Getting my wife to bring me a cup of tea every now and again is not a problem. She's really good at that. Second meaning, a question proposed for solution or discussion. What are one on one? What time shall we have dinner? Four years ago, is my suitcase overweight? And in the future, when we'll be able to fly again, we can ask the same question. Or it's an undesirable situation or cause. You've heard people end the sentence with, and that's the problem when they mean, and that's the undesirable situation or that's the cause. For example, my watch, it stopped working. If I had a problem with my watch, it stopped working. Did you hear me use the word problem as meaning undesirable situation? Because the undesirable situation is the watch has stopped working. The problem is to figure out why or the cause. Sometimes we say the problem is to figure out the problem. So we need to be less sloppy with our wording and discuss undesirable situations and use the words undesirable situations, causes and problems. Because the undesirable situation was my watch stop working. Watch stop working. The problem was to find out why. And the cause I found out was a dead battery. So then I have another problem which is to how to replace the battery. So I have to go out to buy one, bring it back and replace it. Or do I go a place, go to a place where they will charge me to replace the battery? So I have, a, did you notice that how I subtly got in there that replacing the battery, there were two alternative outcomes, replacing it myself or having somebody else do it. 
and then I have to pick between them. So in order to pick between them, I need selection criteria. We'll get to that in a moment. So when faced with a problem, what do most people do? Don't panic, stall. And stall is an acronym for stay calm, think, ask questions and analyze the answers, listen and listen. You get a lot more information from listening than you do from talking. And you have two ears and one mouth. That's the minimum ratio to use them in. So, consider problems and solutions. We currently teach problems and solutions something like this. There's a problem, we have a whole range of solutions which we don't really mention. We focus on the single correct solution and all the others are wrong or incorrect. But that's not true in the real world. It might be true in mathematics where one and one equals two but in the real world, there's generally more than one solution. And we can break those solutions out into optimal and acceptable and unacceptable. Unacceptable can be unacceptable because they're wrong, as in, in, the, in the traditional term of one and one, two is unacceptable. Sorry, two is acceptable, but four is not acceptable. And let me go through and explain. But before I do that, I can point out that there are words in the English language, satisfy is a, means an optimal solution and satisfice means an acceptable solution. Those words are in the dictionary. But of course that begs the problem of who defines the problem. In school, it's the instructor or the textbook. In the real world, your boss may define the problem, or you may have, may have an undesirable situation and you go to your boss with a problem that says, hey boss, we've got an undesirable situation, what do we do about it? But as you get higher in the organization, it becomes more and more behoven on you to define the problem. And if you define the wrong problem, oops, solution is not going to work. So let's look at acceptable solutions. The problem is at the end of this presentation you're going to be hungry. But actually that's the undesirable situation. The problem is not you, well we use the word problem to mean undesirable situation. But the undesirable situation is you're going to be hungry, the problem is what to do about it. And the solution, as we've learned from prior experience, is to eat something. So what are we going to eat? Another problem. Notice how we go from problem to solution, problem to solution. That's an aside. What to eat? Is there only one solution? Well, look for this. Chinese, Italian, Indian, Australian, American. And then within those, there's vegetarian, meat, which meat, fish, which fish, pizza, etc., etc., And then it's where to eat. Do we go out to a restaurant? Now they're open again. Do we eat at home? If we eat at home, do we go out and get takeaway? Do we call for delivery? Or do we cook it ourselves from ingredients that we have? Are you telling me that there's only one solution? to the problem of being, to the undesirable situation of being hungry and the problem of making something, of figuring out what to eat. Unless you're really picky, generally there's more than one solution, which is that will satisfy your hunger. So what, we, what I've talked about is a systematic approach to examine an undesirable situation from a number of perspectives. 
understand the situation. So you understand the situation, I'm hungry. You just determine the root cause of the undesirability. Well, past experience is when you're hungry, it's because your stomach is empty and you, the, you need to put something in your stomach. So you can conceptualize a number of situations in that you've eaten Chinese food, you've eaten Indian food, you've eaten Australian food, you've eaten vegetables or whatever. And you've chosen, you pick one of them and then you perform the transition from the undesirable situation to the selected feasible, conceptual, desirable situation or outcome of the transition process. You cook the meal or you go out and buy it or whatever it is, then you eat it. And after you've eaten it, you test it. Do you still feel hungry? If you don't feel hungry anymore, the problem solving process has been completed and everything is fine. If you do feel hungry, you go back. If you still got some food left over, then you can eat that. But when you go back, you don't have to limit yourself to the same choice that you had before. You can go back to the beginning of the process and think again, I'm still hungry. Do I want something else or not, as the case may be? So I brought in iteration in the problem solving process here, and I'll discuss that at another time. And we do this in a systemic and systematic manner. We call that the problem solving process, the system thinking process, or the decision making process. Now let's look at solutions. We have a continuum of solutions. In the non-system thinking world, is a single correct remainder or wrong? One or one or two. Do you wear a mask, yes or no? That was the question I asked you earlier. In the systems thinking process, the solutions can be optimal, acceptable, or unacceptable. And the solutions lie upon a continuum like this. They can be unacceptable for reasons like they're not feasible, they're not affordable, they're not timely, they can be acceptable and optimal, and then there's a range of solutions. And which particular one do we choose? Well, we ignore the unacceptable ones because they are unacceptable. And we then select between acceptable and optimal based on certain criteria. Is it affordable? Is it timely? Um, which do I prefer, Indian or Chinese? And so we make up the selection criteria until we actually come up with one. The continuum of answers in the non-system thinking world, it's either or, yes or no. The answer is yes, I wear the mask, or no, I don't wear the mask. In the system thinking world, that expands to four possible answers. Yes, I wear the mask. No, I don't wear the mask. It depends, which means I need more information before I decide. I'm admitting that I don't know enough in order to make the decision. And it takes a lot of level of confidence to do that. I don't know, which means I, don't, I, I need more information. And sometimes you can even say, it depends means I don't know, but let's find out and work it out. Or, and I don't know can also mean I don't care. Because I don't know, you tell me, or I don't care whether I wear a mask or not. Those are valid answers. And the I don't know answer dissolves Schrodinger's cat paradox. If you understand Schrodinger's cat paradox, is the cat can be either alive or dead and you have to choose. And the answer and the paradox is you don't know. Well, in system thinking, there's no paradox because don't know is a valid answer. There's only a paradox if you have to answer yes or no. If you don't know what Schrodinger's cat paradox is, 
Look it up on the internet. I'm not going to tell you. And we can draw the continuum this way. No at one end, don't know in the middle, and yes at the other end. And the don't know can also have various degrees of probability. For example, is it going to rain tomorrow? Yes or no? Or, I don't know, there's a 40% probability that it will. And then we have the Likert scale that are used in surveys that strongly disagree at one end, neutral or don't care in the middle, and strongly agree at the other. So there's a continuum of answers. We do use systems thinking all the time, but not in a systemic and systematic manner, and we certainly don't think we're using systems thinking. So moving on, systems thinking and beyond. We have our system, and Sherlock here is trying to understand it. Do you notice that where he is, he has blind spots, he cannot see the entire system. So what does he do? He's smart. He moves. He goes to another point and perceives the system from another place. And he realizes it, that he cannot understand the system completely from inside. So he goes outside and looks at it from various perspectives. So what he's doing is he's being the blind man. He's looking at it from the outside perspectives and the internal perspectives. And so he's actually combining systems thinking and analysis. There isn't generally a standard set of perspectives that's in wide use in systems thinking. I developed these in, in Cranfield under the grant from the Leverhulme Trust based on the work of Barry Richmond. And the number nine is limited according to Miller's rule. So we have to put a lot of in each perspective. And as the elephant is thinking, they're all, as well as being useful viewpoints, they also provide a useful template for collecting and organizing information as I'll show. The external perspectives are the ones that systems thinkers generally use. The big picture, the context, the assumptions, and the operational, what the system does, how it interacts with its environment. And it's a black box perspective because they're not concerned about what's going on inside. The internal perspectives tend to be analysis, that's the functional, what the system does and how it does it, and the structural, how the system is constructed and organized. Now the big picture, the system thinkers came out of operations research where they thought about the system in the sense of what it does and how it related to its environment and adjacent systems. And they sort of say, well, you don't need to worry about internal perspectives anymore, which isn't true because the perspective you need depends on the problem that you have. My watch stopped working. How I use the watch is totally irrelevant other than perhaps it was a cause of the watch stopped working. I use the watch as a hammer to bang something in. Okay, well, that's pretty obvious, you broke it. But if I haven't mistreated the watch and it just stops working, in order to make it work again, I have to understand that it's powered by a battery or there's an electronic circuit in there and then mechanical parts in there and I need to figure out which of the parts stopped it from working. And then you need, so the external and internal perspectives help you understand the situation, help you understand the cause of the undesirability, but they don't really help you come up with solutions. 
for them, you have to go beyond systems thinking into the progressive and remaining perspectives. The progressive perspectives are generic, where this system is an instance of similar systems. Like this watch is an instance of timekeeping. So you've got different kinds of watches and different kinds of ways of keeping time. Or the continuum perspective, which deals with differences and alternatives. There are different ways. There are, what are the differences between the different types of watches? Analog, digital, alarm, non-alarm, and different types of timekeeping. And your out-of-the-box solution generally comes from one of these, because as I teach in my courses, an out-of-the-box solution in a, is in one box is or comes from a different box. And so if you make an assumption that everybody's working in a box, you can use the generic perspective to see who is doing a similar job in a different box. Have they faced your problem? And what did they do about it? And that's where the out of the box solution comes from. We talk about using out of the box solutions, but nobody actually teaches you how to find them. They just say you need them. Well, systems thinking and beyond helps you find out of the box solutions. The temporal perspective, which deals with the history, how you got into the situation and what's going to happen in the future. And the remaining perspectives, the quantitative, are the number, numeric and other quantitative information about that go with the previous seven. And so the first eight perspectives are, prescript, are descriptive. They help you describe what you're perceiving and help you gain that understanding. The scientific perspective is the outcome of the thought process in scientific terms it's called a hypothesis in the rest of the world it's known as a guess about the issue the cause and the solution after you've been doing some thinking and so i picture it this way you have an issue or a situation and let's represent it by the elephant and we're going to perceive it from a number of standard perspectives we have the external or systems thinking perspectives we have the internal or analysis perspectives. We have the progressive perspectives. And we have the quantitative and scientific perspective. And notice that we use the descriptive perspectives to examine the situation and get information back. We think about it for a while and the output is scientific. Now, one way we can use this is we combine the perspectives and the Kipling questions in a matrix like this, and it cues us to ask questions. Because when we're looking at a situation, all right, we're looking at it. What about it? What about it? Well, from the big picture, we can say, who's involved? What are they doing? Where is it? Why are they doing it? How are they doing it? What are the assumptions? Operational would be, what's it doing? Exactly, how does it interact with that other thing? What happens if this happens? And so on, all the way through those perceptions, perspectives. And you may not have an answer to every question because you may not have the information, but you can write down the answers and you can write down the questions and you don't put the answers and questions back in that box. It's not designed for that. I tried it once and people ended up arguing as to which box they would write the answer in, and that's not the point. You put the answers down on a whiteboard or a flip charts or whatever, and you move them into the categories later. Because often you find that a question from a one perspective will open up uh, and uh, will give you information that fits in a different perspective. 
if you write this on a business card size piece of paper and you hold it in your hand when you're in a brainstorming meeting, you do it to yourself. You don't need to tell anybody what you're doing and you will come up with some good questions. And that's how you will get the reputation for asking good questions. And I have used this in consulting. I would go into a situation which I knew very little about, but I knew enough about buzzwords because I was in engineering and they were in engineering. Or, and I would listen to them speak and I would say, well, I've got a silly question. Why are you doing this? Or, or what does this do? Or something like that. And sometimes I would ask the question about why are you doing this? And, and they would think it through and they would come to the realization that they don't need to do it anymore because it's an inherited practice and they were doing it without thinking about it. And when they thought about it, they realized the need was no longer there. And then they think about it, you know, if we stop doing this, we don't have any more undesirability. We fixed the problem. And they go, great, Joe, that was fantastic. How did you know so much about what we do? And I smiled. And I said, that's my job. Here's an example. Let's think about a camera. Let's perceive a camera from different perspectives. Big picture. Where the cameras are used and for what purpose? Operational. Capturing images, transporting the camera, viewing the images, you look in the back. Adjusting the settings, charging the battery. Well, the functions it does are image capture, storage, retrieving, deleting, charging the battery, and so on. From a structural perspective, you've got the camera body, the case, the charger, the lens, and the other bits inside. Generic perspective deals with painting, sketching, and other image capture methods or devices. Continuum different types of models of camera, different materials to use the camera, different ways of capturing images. And the temporal will give you the evolution of the image capturing media from starting off with silver, nit silver nitrate, I think, photographic plates, and then we went to film, and now we're in solid state memory, and it prompts us to realize that in the future we may use something else and we can think about how the number of pixels per inch that's the quantitative perspective have changed over the years to give us higher and higher resolution and so the quantitative perspective also deals with the lens characteristics the focal fit, length fit, whatever size depth amount of light and the scientific perspective well what you make of this information will depend on the problem or the issue not information from every perspective is not necessarily pertinent to the situation you're in and the problem you are trying to solve so when you're thinking about a camera if you want to understand how a camera works, it's the functional and the structural perspectives. If the camera breaks, that those are the perspectives you need. If you want to understand how you capture images, then you've got to think about the camera and the operator and whatever's being photographed or imaged. Transporting the camera, that's an operational perspective, but you also need the structural component of camera operator and camera case. If you're recharging the camera, then you need to know about the camera, the operator, and the charger. So you've got, in the operational perspective, you've got elements of the structure. How about a car? Big picture is the car works on a road work and cars drive the economy because a lot of people and a lot of efforts is spent on making the cars, selling the cars, transporting the cars, using the cars, and so on, and then getting rid of the cars at the end. Operationally, 
we talk about going shopping, taking children to school, going on vacation, and so on. So the functions that the car does are starting, stopping, turning, accelerating, decelerating, crashing. That's a function. We don't particularly desire it, but it happens from time to time. Structural. Cars with doors, chassis, wheels, and boot, or a trunk, as it's called in the US. Generic deals, well, a car is a type of four-wheeled land vehicle, uh, similar to trucks and vans and so on. From the continuum perspective, we would say that there are different types of engines and vehicles. There's a wide choice of manufacturers and models and so on. The temporal gives us the evolution of the car, the steamers, the Ford Model T, internal combustion engines, the Ford Etzel, hybrid cars, electric cars, and it leads us to thinking about cars are gonna be different in the future. Quantitative perspective is kilometers per hour, engine power, number of passengers, number of doors, six wheels, cost, price, etc. Did I say six wheels? Wait a minute. There are four wheels on the ground. Okay. What about the other two? Well, when you drive a car, do you carry a spare? Mm -hmm. All right, what about the sixth? What is that thing you steer with? It's another wheel. Totally different function to the other five, but it's still a wheel, six wheels. Or a house. Location, purpose, and assumptions in the big picture. Operational are scenarios showing what the house is used for in the morning, evening, afternoon, weekdays, weekends, preparing and eating a meal, walking the dog, mowing the lawn, watching television, and so on, doing a home off, working in a home office, functional. What are the functions performed? Eating, sleeping, reading, talking, accessing the internet, throwing out the rubbish, etc. Structural perceptions deal with the electrical, plumbing, heating, cooling, got different parts of the house. Generic is similarity between other houses, between ha houses and buildings and structures serving the same purpose, tents, apartments, and so on. Continuum, that's the differences with those other structures. Temporal is evolution of houses over time, starting from huts through to houses and whatever. Maintenance and repairs, extensions, and so on, how often you have to maintain it. Quantitative, number of rooms, costs, prices, land size, etc. And the scientific, again, depends on the problem or the issue. And again, if you're only interested in an electrical problem, then everything else is, is probably non-pertinent other than the wiring diagram and maybe some of the functions. So, if I look at the problem solving process, and I've alluded to it in this talk, you can write it as you have an undesirable situation at the beginning, you define the problem space and try and understand what's going on. You then conceive the solution options, like in the meal. The problem space is I'm hungry, I need to do something about it. As shown here, you can see the solution options, and I gave them to you, the different types of food, the different cultures, and then you identify the ideal solution criteria. It might be, I want to eat quickly within the next 15 minutes because I'm starved and I only have a few dollars. Well, that cuts out a large number of those solutions. They become unacceptable. You then do the trade-off to figure out which one it is, um, figure out which one can I get the fastest. Okay, that's the fastest. Select the preferred option, that's fine. And then you formulate strategies and plans to implement. So once you've selected that you're going to have pizza, you figure it out. Are you going to go out and get it or are you gonna have it delivered? That's your plan and strategy. You then implement the solution system and you then verify that the solution system remedies the problem. You're not hungry anymore, fine. 
it's done. If you are hungry, you go back around that loop. Problem of space is, I'm still hungry, what am I gonna do about it? That's the problem solving process that everybody use, whether it's a simple problem or a complex problem. Then you've got to think about the timing and the structure of the problem. So operationally, hands up those who can understand me. Is that a question I really want to ask? Should I ask it as hands up those who can understand me or hands up those who cannot understand me? If I say hands up those who cannot understand me and they don't put their hand up, does that mean they cannot understand me? Or does that mean they cannot hear me? If I, put the, if I ask the question, hands up those who can understand me, that means they can both hear me and understand me. But from a temporal perspective, this is a stupid time to ask the question. Look at the slide number, slide 36. So when should I have asked that question at the beginning of the presentation, right? But from the scientific perception, it was the wrong question. I should have asked, hands up those who can hear me like I just said. But wait a minute, don't I want to know both? So I really should be asking two questions at the beginning of the presentation. All right, here's an undesirable situation. I nearly said, here's a problem. Back in Singapore, National University of Singapore, there was this kiosk and students used to, and staff used to line up and queue for tea, coffee, and snacks. But every now and again, especially during lunchtime and breaks between classes, people used to go up and down those stairs and left and right across the, in front of me. And this was an undesirable situation because they would interfere with each other with that queue and disturb people. They didn't actually get into fights, but there was some jostling going on. So what to do about it? What do you think? How could you eliminate the jostling that goes on during those peak times? Well, it just so happens outside the university, there's this side street and cities have these yellow boxes for traffic and cars are not allowed to stop inside a yellow box when they're waiting at a traffic light. So here you can see the traffic moving. So there is absolutely no reason why you can take this solution in, in the traffic box. See the generic problem, generic situation, similarity, congestion. The way you get rid of the congestion is with the yellow box. So your out of the box solution came from the traffic box, you paint that yellow box on the, on the ground outside at the right distance outside the kiosk and the problem should go away because people are used to yellow boxes. I worked that out a month, a few months or so before I left the university and I never solved the problem of finding a suggestion box to put in my suggestion for improvement. So I suppose it's still there. Generic perspective. So I want to give you a very brief introduction to critical thinking. Critical thinking comes from using selection criteria in decision making. It is not about criticism. It's based on logic and reasoning. It uses inductive and deductive logic. It deals with the feasibility and reality of conclusions. It's a sanity check on ideas. It deals with judicious reasoning, what to believe and therefore what to do. 
and it may also be known as smart thinking. So this is just a brief introduction. There's a lot more about it summarized in, guess where? Holistic thinking. Well, let me introduce the subject. When I came to Singapore, I was, I was the first time I'd been in the tropics. And so when we had a class outing or a class trip to a nearby farm, I saw these plastic bags in the tree and I thought, wow, that's a plastic bag tree. I didn't know plastic bags grow on trees. You're smiling. Why are you smiling? Because you have prior knowledge that plastic bags don't grow on trees, they're manufactured in a factory. Fine. But supposing nobody in the group had that prior knowledge and there were a bunch of academics. And one of them would say, hey, let's see if we can get a grant on improving the yield of plastic bags in trees. Or these are all pink. Maybe we can get a grant to try and grow different colors. And now you're laughing even more or smiling. Well, this is what happens in science. Sometimes it happens because nobody knows anything about the subject. And we do the research and we find out, we learn that whatever research you do on, whatever you try, you will not be able to improve the yield of plastic bags. And sometimes we don't know, but other people do know that it's the wrong thing to do. And that's why grant applications are, and public and research papers are peer reviewed prior to publication to make sure we don't publish the equivalent of research into plastic bag trees. But there's a lot of it out there. How about some logic from Des McHale's book? Thank God I'm an atheist. You laugh because it's a contradiction, right? But wait a minute, as an engineer, or as a systems thinker, I see risk management. Yes, I'm an atheist, but you know something? Just in case, thank God I'm an atheist. Or the signs in the shops, don't be cheated elsewhere, come in here. Why? So I can be cheated here or not cheated. The ambiguity is the humor in English or in an optician shop. If you can't see, you've come to the right place. Uh, how can I see the sign? Or in a beauty shop, ears pierced while you wait, pay for two, get one done free. How many ears do you have? Oh, maybe it means the number of piercings. I don't know, I've never had my ears pierced. Or these advertisements, passport for sale, never used, owner going abroad. Think about that. Or how about visit our bargain basement on the third floor? Now that's not as funny as it seems because originally a bargain basement was in the basement and it was a place where you could get bargains. The store was selling returns at markdown or end of season material that they wanted to get rid of before the, the, the next season came in. And so you would be able to get bargains. And so it was linked to a place, but after a while, it, it, the bargain basement started to mean a place where you could get low cost bargains. And yes, that can be moved up to the third floor. It's a place that's out of the way. So if you don't have a basement, you put it up on the third floor. So it's the evolution of language. Let's look at some logic. This is reasoning 
all cats like fish. Snuggles is a cat. Snuggles like fish. True or false? All cats like fish. Snuggles is a cat. So yes, Snuggles likes fish. Well, this one. Snuggles is a cat. Snuggles like fish. All cats like fish. True or false? Traditionally false because Snuggles is a cat and Snuggles like fish, but what about a different cat? Does that cat like fish? We don't know. So in non-systems thinking logic, it's false. Similarly, I live in Adelaide. Adelaide is in Australia. I live in Australia. True or false? That's true. I live in Adelaide. Adelaide's in Australia. Or, I live in Australia, Adelaide is in Australia, I live in Adelaide. I live in Australia, Adelaide is in Australia, I live in Adelaide. No, I could live in Melbourne or Sydney or some other place, so that is false in traditional non-systems thinking logic. But the logic is going from the generic to the specific and the specific to the generic. So when we go from generic to specific, it is true. Snuggles is a cat, generic. Snuggles likes fish, specific. All cats like fish, false. All cats like fish, sorry, I said that wrong. Snuggles is a cat, specific. Snuggles likes fish, all cats like fish. I'm going from the specific to the generic. On the other hand, all cats like fish, that's generic. Snuggles is a cat, specific. Snuggles like fish, true. So you find generic to specific is true, deductive logic. Specific to generic in traditional non-systems thinking is not true, is false. But if we make the paradigm shift in asking questions from non-systems thinking to systems thinking, you see it like this. I live in Adelaide, true or false? That's a closed question. Change the perspective slightly. Systems thinking, I live in Australia, Adelaide is in Australia, do I live in Adelaide? Now the answers can be yes, no, perhaps, and this is an open question. I might actually live in Adelaide because Adelaide is in Australia. Well, if I really cared, how would I work that out? Remember that continuum I showed you? We could look at the probability. How many people live in Australia? How many people live in Adelaide? Divide one by the other and turn it into a percentage. And that's the probability that I live in Adelaide. If we wanted a more accurate probability, we could do something like say, how many academics live in Adelaide? How many academics live in Australia? Do we get a better probability? or how many other categories of people that I fit into live in Adelaide and how many of them live in Australia to try and increase the probabilities, if we can. So you can see how true and false is either zero or 100% closed question. Systems thinking gives you an open question and you've got intermediate answers. Now I want to share a very useful tool. It's a template for critical analysis of arguments from Pegtetl. And an argument is not used in the sense of a dispute. We often use the word argument when we really mean we're disputing. When you're in a dispute, the chain of reasoning that you use is known as an argument. When you're making an argument to support a position. And so you need to think about it in terms of what's the point, what's being claimed, is it, what's the opinion, what's the conclusions, what are the reasons for the conclusion or the point, what is the evidence, what are the unstated premises and connection, snuggles, all cats like fish, snuggles likes fish. What's missing there is snuggles is a cat. What is exactly meant by terminology, wording, 
and eliminate the loaded language so we don't say Snuggles is a fat cat or Snuggles is a lazy cat. We say Snuggles is a cat. And then you assess the reasoning. Is it valid? Is it true? Is it acceptable? Is it relevant? Is it sufficient? And I said, this is a breadth. So I'm not going to go into any more depth here. Just let to know the tool exists and you should be using it. So example of unstated premises. Man goes into a store labeled cheap skate and the shopping assist and the assistant says, no, we don't carry any skates. This is actually a new kind of scraping the barrel discount store. The ambiguity again in the premises, the man walked in looking for a place to buy roller skates, ice skates, or whatever, those kind of skates. Cheap skate is a bargain. So it's a bargain store. Different premises, different interpretations of the word. Or like this one. My husband's a bookkeeper. That's nice. Not really. He checks them out, but he never returns them. So, our drinker is talking about library books. The bar person just says that's nice. Bar person may be thinking about the book paper as a profession because years ago, accountants kept the, the accounts in books. They were written down in books. And so accountants were also known as bookkeepers in the days before spreadsheets and computers. And the template continues. How could the argument be strengthened? If you are making the argument, you think about what you're saying and you provide additional reasons and evidence. And then you use continuum thinking to think about what are the objections that somebody might make to, in your, to your argument and make sure you prevent them so you've got the responses in them. On the other hand, if you're at the receiving end of this argument, somebody has stuck you with it and they've sent you this document which, is, which you need to refute, you then consider and assess counterexamples, evidence and so on and then you look at it, should you modify it or reject it because of the counter arguments, depending on whether you are in a position to reject it or whether you've been asked to look at it and see if you can fix it up. And if you, the last one, if you suspend judgment, identify further information in order to make a judgment. So if you've got, I don't know, or it depends then figure out what it needs what does it depend on? So in summary, I have talked at length about why I gave the talk, what is systems thinking, what's a problem, solving problems, systems thinking and beyond, solving problems using systems thinking beyond and introduce some aspects of critical thinking. And there's a lot more available in this book. Now, takeaways. I gave you acceptable solutions, not only correct solutions. I gave you don't care and don't know as answers. I gave you holistic thinking perspectives, the Kipling questions, active brainstorming, template for critical analysis of arguments, and oh, I nearly forgot, stall, stay calm, think, ask questions, and analyze, listen, and listen. And there are only a few of the hundred plus systems thinking tools available in this book. And if you look on my website, you can find a discount coupon for ordering this book from CRC Press. We met the objectives. I introduced systems thinking, critical thinking. I showed you how to do it by providing examples. I examined aspects of problems gave you some system thinking tools you can use right away. Stall you can use right away. The um, holistic thinking perspectives and active brainstorming might take a few minutes of rethinking about them. And hopefully I've begun to change the way you think and encourage you to 
look more deeply into applying systems thinking. Try it out. Any kind of situation you are in, think about it from the different perspectives and ask those questions. And you will be surprised the number of ideas that are generated. Last few words, ask questions. Think for yourself. Always check the source. Don't take somebody's word for it. Look it up on the internet or in books in the library. Dogpile.com is an excellent meta search engine. I've been using it now for 20 years or so. It searches a number of other search engines and, and gives you the results. Amazon.com is not only a place to buy books, but they have this look inside feature. And sometimes I've found what I was looking for in the book just without needing to buy it. Other times I've bought the book because I found it interesting. Libraries are a great waste of time. I go into the library to look something up and something else catches my eye and I go in there and I read and I read and I read and all of a sudden I realize, wow, it's been very interesting, but I haven't gone in there to solve my problem. I like university libraries for that reason. There are other search engines. Reach up and research the topic. Use multiple sources, perspectives, and think critically, especially about a sermon, whether you're giving it or whether you're receiving it. Thank you for listening. I'd like to turn off the recording.